Seems like we can all get down with a little player coach beef, as there's something seemingly enticing about the behind the scenes drama that goes unseen. And with plenty of egos circulating around throughout the league, there's bound to be some kind of discord. Am I right? In this video, in case this is your first time sitting in on the rifts between players and bench bosses, I'm going to go over a few players that despise their coaches while playing for them. And with that, here are three NHL players that hated their coaches. A unique feud in and of itself, the battle between the Mikes spanned close to over a decade, as Mike Commodore got his first impression of Babcock after being traded from New Jersey to Anaheim. Babcock, who had worked his way up, much like his successor in Toronto, from the AHL, was in his first NHL season behind the bench. And prior to training camp beginning for the 2002-2003 season, according to Commodore, his new coach called to welcome him to the team and instructed he be in his best shape. I don't know who Mike Babcock is. I've never heard of him. I've never had a run-in with him. Nothing. There's no previous history whatsoever. I show up to camp, fight everybody in camp. I'm supposed to play. I'm penciled in. But he has someone else he wants to play. Sends me down to the minors. Cards me in the papers. Says I showed up out of shape. I never showed up out of shape. Because I wasn't talented enough to do it. I would have been in the East Coast League and done in like two years. I was never able to get rid of that reputation. Like, that guy doesn't work out, he says. After being sent down to play for the team, formerly known as the Cincinnati Mighty Ducks, the defenseman, midway through the season, thought he had impressed Ducks management and assumed he would play in Columbus, upon being called up. But as Commodore would soon find out, all was not as it seemed. They called me up and did a fat test on me. I'm not even playing in the game. They do a fat test on me, a pinch test. For anybody that's done that test, it's very subjective. Somebody that you put in front of a magazine that's ripped out of their mind, you can make them like 5% body fat. You just grab the three points where there's a little bit of extra skin. I've been playing four or five nights a week, the whole first half of the year. I'm in great shape. I'm in the exact body weight, if not lighter than I was in training camp. I was always around 10, 11% body fat. They do this fat test and I'm 22% body fat. It was a brand new strength coach and he's like, hey, I gotta fire this in. So he hands it into Babs and Babs waits and gives it to me in front of the team. And that's when I was done in Anaheim, he says. Continue to lead to nothing. Oh, oh, oh. right into the right wing bench. Went to hit Dan Cleary to Commodore. Commodore. That's as close to Mike Babcock as he's been in a while. And around 10 years later, the two would be reunited once more in Detroit. After winning the cup and getting bought out previously by Columbus, the Blue Liner knew this was his last chance to prove himself in the Motor City. And according to him, Babs gave him the assurance that he needed in order to sign a one-year deal with the club, ensuring a spot next to Lidstrom, and that they had a great postseason-bound squad. But unfortunately for Kami, after getting injured in training camp, once he was healthy, the bench boss scratched the defenseman multiple times, allowing him only to play 17 games before he was traded at the deadline. In result, Commodore over the years has been vocal about his distaste for Babcock, saying, I played for coaches that were hard on me and I actually enjoyed that. It has nothing to do with that. He's a liar. He's selfish. His arrogance is off the charts. He thinks everything is about him, he says. Well, if that's not enough evidence to say that this guy obviously despises Babs, I really don't know what is. So anyway, I Amazing. signed the contract, go to Detroit. I was basically right from the get-go. I was scratched to begin the year. The year doesn't start off right. He was in scratch me. He was calling guys up from the minors to keep me scratched. It was basically me out of the lineup. Now we all know that being a netminder can be hard on the nerves, but for four-time Stanley Cup champ Patrick Waugh, on the night of December 2nd, 1995, it was much more than simply the position agitating the goaltender, as the Detroit Red Wings, who were a very deep team at the time, made a spectacle of Waugh to say the least. By the first frame's end, the Wings were already up 5-1 to one on the Habs, with three of their goals scored on the power play. Many coaches by this time would have granted their goalie some mercy, but the rookie coach at the time, Mario Tremblay, still believed that his team had a chance at redemption. To make things worse, Detroit still wasn't satisfied, and as the offensive onslaught continued, its biggest casualty was the man between the pipes. As the goals continued to mount, Waugh's frustration did as well. After fans began jeering the start netminder, he threw up his hands in exasperation. And before backup goalie Pat Jablonski 
could replace him. Sergei Fedorov threw in the last dagger, making it 9 to 1 directly prior to Wa getting pulled. Humiliated, the three time Vesna recipient didn't take to the prolonged embarrassment lightly, and in result of Tremblay allowing the psychological torture to overstay its welcome, and still neglecting to offer moral support, Wa immediately let Montreal's team president know that he had just played his last game as a hab, but Tremblay still claimed that there was a method to the madness in not pulling Wa. I didn't want to put Patrick Waugh out during the game, he says. I preferred to wait until after the second period in the dressing room to tell him, he says. But the netminder didn't exactly see the coach's tactics as common courtesy. If I'd had some word of support from Mario Tremblay, if I'd felt he wanted to help me, I wouldn't have gone to Ronald Corey. That's when it hit me, and I told him, I have just played my last game with the Canadians, Waugh says. Regardless for Waugh, following the trade, winning two more cups with Denver, probably wasn't so bad. But for Tremblay, his career didn't remain unscathed, as a coach after one more season behind the bench was replaced by Elaine Vigneault. And Tremblay hasn't been a head coach since. It says Malcolm declined to elaborate on how his on-ice relationship with Kessel fell apart, but it's clear he grew tired of feeling caught between the ongoing Sullivan-Kessel rift according to multiple team and league sources those sources also say Malkin had come to believe Kessel was content with two titles and mostly interested in his statistics. Malkin was worried he'd be seen the same way if Kessel remained his winger. Phil Kessel, one guy that's for sure one of a kind. Quirky, opinionated, and hilarious, Kessel easily captured the hearts of fans and several teammates. As a forward immediately found refuge in the Steel City after escaping the media circus in Toronto, Kessel had been accused of being quote-unquote difficult to coach. But shortly after his arrival, the immediate success the Penguins had seemed to put any animosity between Kessel and his new coach Max Sullivan on the back burner. Until this happened. The hilariously comical exchange between Evgeny Malkin and Phil Kessel that went on in Nashville. While it may seem unrelated, I believe this was only a sign of things brewing behind the scenes. But the real beef between Kessel and his coach was most likely the fact that, despite his numbers, the winger was often forced, for his last couple seasons anyway, to play on the third line, and not with Malkin as his center. Once the supposed rift surfaced among the media, Sullivan denied having any sort of ongoing feud with number 81. Even still, after a rather slow start midway through the 2018-19 season, former Penguin Pascal Dupuis didn't hold back when asked why he believed Pittsburgh was struggling. The Pens alum, who had just previously attended a game and visited former teammates in the locker room at PPG Paints, painted a picture of disconnect when asked about Sullivan, Malkin, and Kessel. I'm not sure the message passes well between both players and the man behind the bench. The message doesn't go through half the time with three quarters of the players, he says. While we didn't exactly get the full story from Kessel or his former coach, it wasn't long after that the forward found himself moving to the desert, upon a trade. Sullivan, when confronted with the news, replied with, Phil was a big part of the Stanley Cup championships that he helped us win, he says. But certainly, we felt the change needed to be made to the team, and that was part of it. 